I'm here at the World Social Forum, which is an annual gathering of social movements and progressive organisations from all over the world. This year is in Tunis, and it's 12 years since the first one happened. So I'm going to talk to people about both the resistance that movements are building to the global economic system that works in the interests of corporations and the 1%, but also the alternatives that they're creating, which work in the interests of people. So the first thing is, what is food sovereignty? Well, food sovereignty is the right of peoples and communities to define their own food policy, to decide what is food that is nutritious, culturally appropriate, adequate for them. It's the right of people to determine how food is produced, how it's distributed, how food should be shared, how it should be consumed, how it should be costed. In 2013, there shouldn't be hunger. And if there's hunger, it's because, not because there isn't enough food in the world, but it's because of the way it's being produced, the way it's being distributed, the way it's being captured, concentrated. There are a number of different ways to go about bringing food sovereignty, making it a reality. So for example, the supporting the rights of smallhold producers to produce, which means making sure they have secure access to land, water, seeds, making sure that they have enough credit, that farmers and fishers and other food producers are not driven to debt, to make sure that pastoralists are able to survive um, you know, with small, small whole dairy and so on. So there's that bit. Then there's the whole issue of regulating and controlling local markets, building markets from the ground up. So because food sovereignty advocates people's power and it advocates the power and ability of citizens to exercise their rights to make decisions rather than allowing corporations or market gurus to make those decisions. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a very direct challenge to neoliberalism. Yeah, my name is Gonzalo Barron. I am from Argentina, but I'm based in Brazil. So over the years, the global justice movement has done a lot of mobilizing against, campaigning against the World Trade Organization and, and free trade agreements generally. I'm interested to know, particularly in Latin America, about the beginnings of alternative ways of doing trade that aren't you know, in the interests of, of multinational corporations. Okay, yeah, so what we always say is that the alternatives uh, emerge from, from the struggle. The government from Venezuela, uh, Hugo Chavez, launched the proposal of building what he called uh, El Alba, Alba, Alternative Bolivarian for the Americas. Now it changed the, their name. But it was a, a, a way of um, doing co cooperative efforts among countries based not in, in free trade, but in, in cooperation in terms of health, in, term, or in terms of food, but also in terms of, of, of energy. The other dimension uh, are the, the, the common programs they establish on education and health uh, and sharing experiences of uh, good um, policies. Uh, for instance, the, the case of Cuba that had a lot of experience in, in terms of education and health, yeah. they change um, oil uh, by uh, education. And that was more or less the same with Bolivia. Uh, in that case, it was um, food. So it, it was kind of negotiated uh, collaboration and cooperation. exchange, yeah, yeah. cooperation and exchange, not always on the basis of commodities, but exactly. often on the basis of you know health and education. Yeah, things. People exactly. are very important to people's lives, but are not kind of necessarily <laughs> immediately monetized. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And one of the things Gandhi taught us in civil disobedience that if there is a bad law, we have an ethical responsibility to resist that law and to break that law. At Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, we've been partnering with other allies and support organizations to really think about how is it that we're going to move from a pollution economy to an actual sustainable economy. Oftentimes, these communities are impacted by the toxic dumping, um, by the contamination of water, but also the contradiction that oftentimes these uh, folks are workers in, um, in those plants or are those uh, cities or those communities are dependent on those plants being there for jobs or for local livelihood. And so I think what we've been trying to do is address those both issues at the same time. How is it that we 
uh, transition out of our dependence on fossil fuel as a country and as a society, but then also how do we take the needs of the people most impacted duly and um, oftentimes um, dependent on those industries and actually transition into something very different. Could you give me an example of, of uh, somewhere where that's maybe started to happen yeah. or you're working yeah. on that? Part of what folks at Black Mesa Water Coalition are doing is actually going back to traditional methods of actually looking at what, what is it that those communities do. So for example, shearing wool, um, you know, shearing um, sheep to then actually get wool to then begin to sell that. Creating solar, you know, it's a desert and so what's the biggest, one of the biggest uh, things you have is sun and so one of the things that they're talking about is creating solar you know energy companies that are run by Navajo people and trying to think about again food and agriculture and the development of food so that production can also happen on a local level and so those are just some examples of what then the transitioning um, from you know a bad dirty uh, fossil fuel economy and a local context can do in terms of really trying to think about what would a new economy that connects it culturally back to their roots as well. So we're here on the streets of Tunis on a demonstration as part of the World Social Forum. These are the streets that uh, two years ago people were protesting on as part of the uh, movement that brought down Ben Ali, the dictator. We're here with people from all around the world celebrating the idea that another world is possible. One of the things that is important is to be able to focus on progressive taxation so that all of us pay the standard fair share of our taxes. So that if, if, if I have access to more income, then I should be able to pay much more than somebody else who has a much less income. At the end of the day, we know taxation is important in financing government, but the, the most important bit is fair taxation for everyone so that all citizens can benefit equally and those, some people are not necessarily punished or uh, do not benefit uh, directly from the taxes that they pay. It has been clearly proven that it is possible for developing countries to generate resources from their own domestic sources. And the, 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 the most obvious and common source is taxation. If you have a good tax administration regime, you have a good tax authority, and you have a good tax mobilization system so that citizens are clearly aware of why they are paying the tax and they can see the benefits of paying the tax and that's why we're talking about where the money is spent. You don't just collect but you also must spend it in a manner that will demonstrate to citizens that they are, the, the taxes they pay are providing services for them, they are getting access to good roads for instance, uh, access to water, access to quality health care, access to quality education. This whole argument about linking the struggles is getting better and sharper but even more, the, 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 the greater understanding that it's not now just a southern problem or a southern issue, that actually these issues happen the same way, maybe differently, but they are linked across the world. And that uh, people engaged in these struggles in Europe, in London and elsewhere, is the same way that we do it in Nairobi, in Johannesburg, or whatever else it is. You can no longer split our defenses on the basis of that this is a north-south south sort of dichotomy. Now, we, we clearly can tell if austerity was killing us in Africa through the structural adjustment program, it's the same thing they are forcing on Greece, it's the same thing they are forcing on Spain and the rest of these countries. And people are resisting that. And, and, and I think th th this sort of uh, the links across the board has also helped to re-energize the spirit of the struggle in Africa being an activist is first and foremost the baseline of how you defend what principles, values, and the commons that you believe in. 
that there's nothing wrong uh, about challenging the dominant structures of power. Then actually challenging power is the basis of how uh, you stop being made powerless. We can say it is a securitization of future. It's an attempt to lock in privatization forever. Even if they will fail, which will allow again the drug addicted rage to accumulate. I'm Antonio Tricarico, I come from Rome in Italy. I work for um, an association called ReCommon. For some people, the, the commons is, is not a it's not a word they use in everyday yeah. language. So so how, how do we explain Commons very simply. The Commons is more a political philosophy in terms of how to re redistribute power while living and, and in particular by uh, living based on the livelihoods uh, we have around us. But if you want to get a definition, I would say for sure in our society, uh, land, food, knowledge, they're definitely Commons and that's why we need to have a, a law say that the exercise of power and dominance in these things is by law limited. We're talking about ownership in common, the, demo the control is democratic, but actually some of the details of how that might come about are, are about the struggle itself to get there in a sense. Exactly. It's through the practising of the change that you will redefine really at one point the solutions. It's not a top-down exercise. The easiest way, given that there is not one size fits all, I think it's just like by practising the struggle against anti-privatisation means building a different type of a solution, if you are serious. What we need to do is constitute water and many other things as a commons, as something that is not the property of anyone, but that everyone has the right to, to access, they has the right to access it and an obligation to safeguard it. So, uh, in our case, in the case of the Thessaloniki water uh, company that is soon to be privatised, what we thought was we should all get some money together, buy off the company in the public tender, and instead of privatizing it, socializing it, which means that create a structure that is democratically controlled through cooperatives on the, on the base level, on the neighborhood level, and uh, then this union of cooperatives will form a company that is going to look after Thessaloniki's water uh, following certain criteria. It's, it's going to be protection of the environment, access for everyone, and non, it will be a non-profit company. We were very much inspired by the Bolivian example. The year 2000, they had a huge struggle against a private company that wanted to privatize the water in Cochabamba. Uh, of course, uh, the situation in Europe is quite uh, different, so we should uh, adapt these same principles to our own specific conditions. How would you define an illegitimate debt and how would you define a, a debt audit? Illegitimate debt is a concept that we developed in Freedom from Debt Coalition that uh, refers to certain kinds of debts that, one, um, were contracted uh, at the behest of powerful political people. Uh, secondly, they did not benefit the people or cause damage to communities and the environment. And third, the terms of the loan are onerous. People think all debts are legal, but not all that is legal is legitimate from a development and rights perspective, from perspective of movements. And a debt audit is precisely looking at the question of whether debts are illegitimate or not, or not but in yeah. a democratic yeah. forum. Yeah. The Indignados movement in Spain, what it was saying is we want real democracy. So people say we want another system, a system that takes into account the people and, and the planet. So sometimes when the establishment say you, there is no alternatives, 
that just the only solution to the crisis is privatized uh, cuts, etc. People have said, no, we have alternatives. There are a lot of initiatives at the local level that are going on in the frame of the uh, solidarity economy. Can you give me some examples of okay. what that is? Alternative, like alternative banks, uh, credit scope, when you can put your money and your money is given to the people who need it to begin a project that no bank will give them right. an option to, to go on. After the occupation of places, some people begin to work on urban gardens, on agroecological consumer scope, buying directly to a, to a farmer. The important thing is, in a way, to build up alternatives that show that another world is possible and at the same time say we do not believe in democracy, we want a real democracy and we want to decide and we want to political changes. I think these two things are key to really change the world and to get some kind of, of big change. <laughs> How do we reach the people with a new narrative that really shows them that this is an issue that deals with the system? So we've seen the financial crisis, we've got an ongoing climate crisis. Where do you think the global movements are in terms of articulating and starting to build an alternative to the neoliberalism that's at the centre of all those crises? I think that in the social movements around the world there are alternatives, but those alternatives deal with some aspects. And in order to build a global alternative that deals with all aspects, that is holistic, there has to be a dialogue between all these different kind of alternatives, like the Buen Vivir, like the uh, limits to growth, like the defense of the commons, like food sovereignty, like uh, the proposal of deglobalization, promotion of cooperatives. They all address some very important issues. The alternative, the alternative, is not going to come out of uh, the heads of a group of intellectuals that come to a, a statement or no, it's going to come from the experience, and of course, experience have different realities, and so they are not global. So it, the alternative, or the alternatives, will come from this different experience. The World Social Forum is a huge and sometimes chaotic place, but a place where people are daring to dream of a myriad of alternatives to an unjust world. Some of these are complementary, Others there are disagreements about, but the fact that this is a meeting of a global movement means there is a common direction of travel towards real democracy and a sustainable and inclusive world. Another world is possible if we fight for it.